years ago, I asked myself this question. I said, what's all this fuss I keep hearing about the millennial generation? At the time, um, I was working at the Wall Street Journal, and I was writing a column about business schools. And more and more, I was hearing from MBA programs that they were seeing this strange, exotic breed of student coming through that they didn't know what to make of. And I thought, wow, this does uh, require further investigation. So I did some reporting with corporate recruiters as well as business school people. And I wrote a column for the journal. And um, I got so much reaction to that column in terms of emails, phone calls, uh, that I just felt like there's got to be a lot more here <clears throat> than one short column could cover. So I continued my investigation. And I soon realized that I had my next book project. The result was this book that, <clears throat> that came out last fall. And um, since then, I've gotten incredible reactions again uh, from all sorts of people. Um, I've spoken to a lot of corporate audiences. I've spoken to a lot of college audiences. Uh, I even spoke at the local library in my little town in New Jersey where a lot of parents showed up to talk about their kids who are part of this generation. But, um, but I think probably most of you have had experience with this generation, either as employees or perhaps as children or both. Um, so what I'm going to tell you won't be totally new, but I think you'll probably find some interesting new things about what they're doing in the workplace, which is the focus of the book. So who are the trophy kids? Well, these are some of the highlights. Um, the millennial generations defined generally as people who were born in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, they have very high self-esteem, technology savvy, multitasking. Um, they want a lot out of their careers. They want personal development. They want work-life balance. They want meaningful jobs. Um, and they're very civic-minded, which is one of their most appealing attributes. And of course, one of their most significant characteristics is they're the product of helicopter parents. And if any of you don't know that term, because um, I have been surprised by a few audiences that didn't know what helicopter parents meant, it comes from the idea of helicopters hovering. So these are the parents who hover over their children well into adulthood. <laughs> so we're going to talk more about them first, because I think they are a large <clears throat> part of why millennials are the way they are. Um, for the book, I interviewed a lot of parents. Um, and I'd say, so um, would you consider yourself a helicopter parent? Oh, no, 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 not a helicopter parent. But I do this and this and this and this for my children because I love them. I want, it, I want them to do the best they possibly can in the world. Um, there was only one person I interviewed, a man who was a petroleum engineer, who admitted, he said, I'm a helicopter parent and I'm proud of it. And, he went on then to recount how he had visited colleges on his son's behalf without his son even going with him. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, some of the stories I heard were actually quite amazing. One mother told me that she was always encouraged by her children's schools to get involved, to know what they were doing in the classroom, to go to PTA meetings, and to know their teachers. And she said, and suddenly, when they reach the college gate, we have to go away, and it's all over. And she said, I can't do that. Um, so because of that attitude, more and more colleges are including in their orientation message the idea that, OK, it's time to let go now. And they're trying to be very gentle about it, though, because these parents are pretty powerful forces. And they don't easily, easily go, go back home. What's most troubling to me <clears throat> is that this continues into the workplace, that almost every company I interviewed had at least one or two stories about parents trying to get involved either in the job search or worse, in the uh, performance evaluations after the child was hired. <laughs> and I heard it often enough that I felt like it's not pervasive, but it's also not an isolated case by any means either. Perhaps the most amazing story was told to me by the head of HR at FedEx. He said not only did the parents call and want to come for the interview, the job interview, they asked if FedEx would pay their travel expenses to get there. So sounds crazy, but, uh, but it's true. Now, some companies realize they can't risk alienating these parents because they'll lose their child in the process if they really want to hire them. So they're doing things like having parent days at the office. I think Merrill Lynch is probably most famous for starting this, um, where they actually let the parents come and spend a day at the office and see where their children work 
get a look at downtown New York and and just have a have a have a more comfortable feeling about their child child being in Manhattan working for this big this big investment banking firm and uh, uh, at Ogilvy Public Relations in New York they did a similar thing and they actually used the parents for focus groups to learn about what they thought about some of their clients products so they they sort of made it useful to themselves as well but the idea is that they don't want parents to feel totally left out but they obviously have to draw boundaries here and no company of course would let parents sit in on job interviews or get involved in performance evaluations but one company, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, told me that they actually will let parents listen on the telephone when they make a job offer to their child. The, the ground rules are that the parents don't ask questions then, but their attitude is the parents are going to be very involved in this decision, so they might as well know up front all the terms of the offer we're making to, to their child. I did a survey of corporate recruiters um, to get their attitudes about the millennial generation and the most common adjective used to describe them was entitled. Um, that they feel they have, they have these great expectations. They really are trophy kids who got trophies for almost everything they did, whether they excelled or not. So they expect um, a lot out of life and a lot out of their jobs. And I think they're one of the most credentials-driven generations. Um, the dean of a business school told me that <coughs> some parents actually emailed him an Excel spreadsheet that chronicled their child's achievements since preschool. <laughs> so it's all about achievement, getting ahead. And because of that, some of the young people I interviewed said what they really want is a true meritocracy in the workplace. In other words, they want to get ahead as fast as they feel their experience and abilities allow them to. And uh, one young man I interviewed at an investment banking firm said he was very frustrated that it would take him perhaps 10 years to become a managing director and that this just wasn't acceptable to him and he didn't know if he would stay there because of this, um, this rather rigorous uh, path to getting to that level that he felt he was prepared, he, he would be prepared much sooner. But these are some of the recruiter perceptions that they're lazy, entitled, they have no patience for paying their dues. And I think I found this idea of not paying their dues, especially um, a source of frustration for the Generation X managers. Um, for some reason, the baby boomers seemed a little more understanding of this generation, but the Gen Xers, maybe because they had paid their dues and felt that it wasn't fair that millennials wanted to, to have these high-level meaningful jobs right from the start, that they really were upset with what they were seeing from this new generation. Um, Work-life balance, I said earlier that's one of their priorities and, and I think it really is uh, something that they're going to demand. Like all of the generations have wanted more balance in their lives, but the millennials will really insist on it, I think. Um, I heard this so many times, work isn't the place you go to, it's what you do. And what they mean by that is because of technology, I can work anywhere, anytime, as long as I get the job done. So if I want to go work out in the afternoon for two hours, I'll make it up at home that night on my laptop. Of course, not all employers are agreeable to that. FaceTime is still a big deal to many companies. Um, the, probably the most uh, complete example I found of true flexibility was at Best Buy, of all things. Um, this wasn't their retail staff. This was their headquarters office staff. But they have a program called Results Only Work Environment. And they, uh, <clears throat> they really do allow a lot of their young employees to set their hours. Uh, they obviously have to come in at certain times for meetings and things, but they really do get to determine when they work uh, for the most part and do a lot of it remotely. <clears throat> now, a lot of, it, lot of millennials are, are trying to use their iPods in the office, which is a great source of frustration to employers. They want to wear blue jeans to work. Um, it all seems rather harmless and maybe in a creative environment like many of you work in, that would be fine. <laughs> but in the corporate world, uh, they, they're finding that the millennials are demanding too much. They really do see it as a social organization, not just a place to, to work. Um, uh, one story I heard, um, I spoke at a conference of construction managers, and a woman came up and said that a young woman in her office had decided she couldn't stay there any longer. She said she needed to walk, walk her dog twice a day, and she needed the freedom to leave when that was necessary. <laughs> And her, her, her parting words were, my job is interfering with my life. 
So that, that sort of sums up a lot of their attitudes, I think, that their life comes before their jobs. And I talked about them being trophy kids, getting used to <coughs> getting rewards, uh, sometimes for not really doing all that much. And some people call them praise junkies. Um, I was interviewing a French professor at Dartmouth College, and <coughs> she was very frustrated with her millennial students for a variety of reasons. Uh, she said they treat her like a travel agent when they go abroad to France, that she has to arrange everything for them. And um, she said what makes her the most upset, though, is that they, <coughs> they know she's a demanding teacher who doesn't give A's easily uh, before they get into the class. But once they're in the class, they really don't like this criticism. And she said one student went so far as to come in and say, I really think you should be nicer to us and make nice comments sometimes. And so she said, I'm going to give you this to use on the papers. And she gave her a, a smiley face stamp to stamp on their papers when she liked something. <laughs> so, and they also like a lot of detailed directions and guidance that even though they're very smart and high achieving, they've been used to parents and teachers telling them exactly what to do to get ahead or to get what, whatever their goal is. And um, an, a manager at a big pharmaceutical company said that one young man didn't finish his project on time. And he asked him why. And he said, you forgot to remind me it was due. <laughs> so it's like they're still, they feel like they're still in school. And I think the most troubling part of all this is that they have a discomfort with ambiguity, uh, with making independent decisions. It's almost like they've worked on teams so much in school that they've become overly dependent on consensus and collaboration. And um, I think there's concern how, how effective they will be as leaders as they, as they get older and <clears throat> move up the ladder in companies. Now, obviously, multitasking and technology are their greatest assets because they grew up um, with technology all around them. And they are very effective at this. And they, I think they can bring efficiency to the workplace because of that. Um, I, one young woman at IBM said it's hard for her to imagine not doing a million things at once. And this raises concerns about how focused can they be when they have a serious issue or problem. You know, this, they've been called the ADD generation because they're always doing so many things that they may not be doing any one of them all that well at times. Um, and then there's this communications gap I discovered in the workplace where um, email to them is almost like a dinosaur. They really just want a text or instant message. And older managers are confounded by this. But even more so, I think they find it bizarre that these young people would text them when they're only a few feet away from them rather than walk over and talk face to face. <laughs> As I said earlier, I think their most um, admirable trait is that they are very altruistic. Um, when I interviewed the young people, I'd say almost every one of them talked about wanting to do something either in their personal lives or their jobs or both that would involve giving back to society. And I interviewed one young woman who had worked at one of the investment banks, and she said she just felt like she was making rich people get richer and that she needed to do something more significant in her life. So she went back to uh, get her MBA at Berkeley, and now she's working in renewable energy at one of the utility companies. A big force on campus right now is Teach for America. Um, some recruiters, in fact, found Teach for America such, such a serious competitor that they've actually partnered with them where they allow students that they hire to go away and teach for two years and then come back to the company. I think personally that this is something that this generation will pursue uh, seriously even as they get older. But some cynics wonder if when they're saddled with a mortgage and kids and more responsibility, if they really will still be committed to their goal of making the world a better place. So with this generation, we now have four generations in the workplace. And this can be a very explosive brew in some companies. Um, this is a summary of the four generations, their birth years, and how many of them are currently in the United States. So you see the millennials are the biggest generation, and they will be the ones to replace the retiring baby boomers and traditionalists. Now I've gone over these, <coughs> these traits of the millennials. Um, in contrast to them, 
Generation X is much more self-reliant, cynical. Um, they share some of the traits of the millennials, such as uh, technology skills, but they, they're very different in many ways. Um, then we had the baby boomers who are more workaholic. They define themselves often by their jobs, more competitive. And then the traditionalists uh, are much more uh, <coughs> dependable, much more loyal to companies. And so the, this, these two quotes, I think, shows you, show you how the conflict is playing out a bit. Um, the first comment was, came in, a, in an email to me after my article ran in the Wall Street Journal. And the second one was posted on a, a blog on the Wall Street Journal website. <laughs> So the main points of contention that I've sort of touched on already are entitlement, their constant need for feedback and praise, managers wanting face time, millennials wanting to work when they want, um, and their casual manner and communication style. I think sort of the ultimate irony is that the managers who are complaining about these kids are their parents. <laughs> They're the ones who raised them, and uh, yet they seem to not understand why their employees are like their own kids. <laughs> so basically, after I did all my research, I, I, found, I found it a fascinating generation. This was, I think, the most um, certainly interesting and enjoyable book I've written so far. And um, I think what makes them interesting are some of their seemingly conflicting characteristics, and I think it will be fascinating to see how this all plays out as they become older and, uh, and take on more responsibilities in the workplace. So finally, my book was, I investigated this and my book came out um, before the economy went into a tailspin, but I since have talked to some millennials and to some career service directors at colleges about how they're coping with the economy and I think it's really a huge shock. I think they've been so used to having their expectations fulfilled, um, that uh, to graduate without a job is, is devastating for some of them. I think one of the most positive outcomes of all this economic turmoil could be that they are more resilient and that they become more realistic in their expectations, more flexible. Um, but I think that they still will have the same basic values even when <coughs> they come out of this recession. They'll still want work-life balance, they'll still want diversity in the workplace, and they'll still want to do what they consider meaningful work. So I think it 